We have been saved by grace, by the choice of a loving God. So let us come and worship with our all. This is a service for Sunday, October the 31st. May it be a blessing to you. Uh, one announcement, uh, our musician, Paul, uh, retired this week and has moved out of town, but he's actually uh, still sending me some videos, so uh, we still get to uh, listen to him uh, in this format. Uh, so let's uh, now begin worshiping God, uh, singing together. <laughs> Shall we gather at the river where bright angel feet have trod with its crystal tide forever flowing by the throne of God? Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. On the margin of the river, washing up in silver spray, we will walk and worship ever at the happy golden day. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Ere we reach the shining river, lay we every burden down. Grace our spirits will deliver and provide a robe and crown. Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. holy, and by your grace, through the gift of your Son's life and death, by your Holy Spirit, you make us holy too. You make us saints. So on this day, help us to worship knowing we belong to you, knowing that uh, our salvation is complete. And so with that confidence, help us to worship and live with our all. As we celebrate this day that is so often about creepy crawlies and fear in our society, thank you that you rescue us, that you make us your holy people, that you give us victory over um, all evil and over even our own sin, our own struggles. Lord God, today may we trust you with more than we have before. May we give a little more of our heart and soul and mind and strength to you. Forgive us for times we rely on ourselves, we rely on things other than you. Forgive us for the hurtful things we've said to our neighbors, for the ways we've uh, disobeyed you and grieved your heart. In silence, Lord, we confess to you our personal struggles and ask for your forgiveness and help. Make us whole and make us holy. Make us like Jesus by your Spirit's power. And may we be lost and therefore found in his love. This we pray in Jesus' name. And together we share the prayer that he taught, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear the good news. By grace through faith, God has set you free. God has made you new. You are a saint of the Lord. Receive this gift and know God's peace. Amen. Our scripture reading today is uh, Mark chapter 12, starting at verse 28. Uh, Jesus has now arrived in Jerusalem and has just been arguing with some of the religious leaders there, and we join the story there. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. The teacher of religious law applied, replied, well said, teacher. You've spoken the truth by saying there is only one God and no other. And I know it is important to love him with all my heart and all my understanding and all my strength and to love my neighbor as myself. This is more important than to offer all the burnt offerings and sacrifices required in the law. Realizing how much the man understood, Jesus said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord God, speak to us and shape us by your holy word that we've just read. Send your spirit on us that we can become people of your word. And send your spirit to help me preach with faithfulness and love. In Jesus' name, amen. Stories about people uh, getting off on technicalities are either uh, hilarious or frustrating, depending on how much we uh, care about the law that's being skirted. Uh, I remember reading about one man uh, in the European Union who, when they banned the sale of uh, incandescent light bulbs uh, so that people would have to buy the energy efficient ones, uh, he bought up all the remaining stock of incandescent light bulbs that were now really, really cheap and sold them as heaters for your home that could be screwed into any light bulb fixture. Uh, and that was legal. You couldn't sell a light that wasted so much, much of its energy as heat, but you could buy a heater that also happened to emit some light. The spirit of the law was to try and um, get people to cut down on their emissions, get people to uh, use energy well. But the letter of the law just said, you can't sell this kind of light bulb. And he started selling the exact same thing as a heater. Is that funny or frustrating? Kind of both. Uh, on the other side of that, uh, sometimes knowing the, the heart behind the law can uh, help you get around it. Uh, my high school had about 2,000 students and even though uh, there were two different lunch periods, there was not room in the cafeteria uh, for all of us. And if it was a rainy or cold day, uh, it meant that you, you really had to struggle to find somewhere to sit. And uh, there was a rule, of course, that we couldn't eat in the halls because uh, that was you know, disruptive to teachers teaching in the classrooms. But I discovered with some of my friends that if you were clean and quiet and polite when a teacher came and asked you to move, you could get away with it. 
Uh, they just didn't want you to make a mess and they didn't want you to disturb the classrooms. And so the rule, you can't eat in the hall, uh, got avoided if you were living up to the reason behind it. We have a complicated relationship with the rules sometimes. And we judge each other pretty harshly. Um, for example, the right speed to go is whatever speed you're going on the highway, right? Uh, everyone has their comfort level. Some people drive exactly the speed limit. Some people drive 10 kilometers an hour more. Some people 30 kilometers an hour more. And everyone on the road who's going slower than you is, oh, you know, so silly about the rules and the speed limit doesn't matter that much. You can go as fast as I'm going. Everyone going faster than you is a maniac. We're all driving along, slightly judging each other on how well you follow the rules, the law. Now, the Bible contains uh, a huge numbers of rules. Uh, a huge number of rules. In fact, uh, the first five books together uh, are called the law. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy together make up the Torah, which is the law. And uh, ancient Jewish scholars counted up 613 different commands for us to live by to be faithful to God. 613 commandments in the law. Uh, 248 of them are positive, you know, you shall, and uh, 365 of them, one for each day of the year, are you shall not. Uh, these first five books of the Bible give 613 very important instructions on how to live. Some of them simple, some of them complicated, but all of them were how you faithfully follow God in your life. And so this conversation uh, that Jesus has with a scholar of the law, a scholar of the Torah, uh, a religious teacher, uh, comes out of that tradition of really trying to understand and live out 613 different commands from God for your whole life. And this young scholar comes to Jesus and asks, out of all of those, which is most important? And Jesus' answer is not uh, radically new. Uh, other religious teachers, other rabbis, other scholars had said basically the same thing that Jesus did. Um, and he actually doesn't answer the question quite directly of which one is the most important, because he quotes two parts of the Torah, two laws from uh, Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. Hear, O Israel, there's one Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength. And then he sneaks in, uh, just as important from Leviticus 19, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus summarizes, as people had before him, the whole of God's law as love God with everything and love the people around you like you love yourself. Those aren't two separate things. Loving God and loving people are linked. And this uh, this young scholar, he nods and says, that was well said. You're right. And as Christians, sometimes today, we can hear that and make it smaller than it is. We hear the line uh, that the heart of the law is love. And we embrace that. But that sometimes what we do is say, so I don't need to worry about all the rest of it, right? The other 611 commands, and by the way, if you add in 
the prophets and the New Testament. There's a lot more than that. Um, but the other 611 plus uh, don't matter as long as I love God and love other people. We don't need to bother with them. But that's not what Jesus does uh, with these two commands. They're not meant to cover over the rest of the Bible. They're meant to teach us how to read it. We don't always know how to love God with everything. We don't always know how to take care of our neighbor, or who counts as our neighbor. So rather than these pushing us away from the rest of the rules, the rest of God's guidance for how to live, these can be tools. Love God, love your neighbor. For all the other commands in the Bible, these can teach us how to read this essentially important book. I'll use an example. Uh, so this is from uh, Leviticus chapter 23, uh, verse 22. Uh, the people of Israel are commanded, you know, when you move into the promised land and you plant your fields, uh, do not harvest to the corners of your fields uh, when, you, when it's harvest time. Don't harvest all the way around the edges and get absolutely everything. Kind of a weird command on its own, right? Like, what does that have to do with my life now? Don't harvest to the edge of your field. I don't know how many of you watching this own a field that produces food. Uh, I'm guessing not many. I know some people that do. <laughs> So we could read that as a, you know, oh, that's Old Testament, doesn't matter. But the purpose we're given for this law is don't harvest to the corners of your field so that the poor and the stranger can get something to eat. This was a way of making sure that those who didn't have a field, those who didn't have um, their own property, could be fed. You'd leave the edges of your field for uh, the people that needed it. The literal exact don't harvest to the edge of your field um, may not apply to us. Or you could you know, go home and say, well, uh, I heard from today's sermon that the Bible tells me not to go to the edge of my field, so I'm not going to mow the edge of my, uh, my lawn. Would that be obeying what God is trying to tell us there? No. But this command still matters to us. It teaches us how to love our neighbor. You know, providing someone who's poor with food to eat, providing for the, the refugee and the stranger, that's what God is getting at in this passage. And we can still do that. We can still sit with people that need us. We can still you know, give to one of the food banks. We can treat our employees well. We can treat other kids in class well when they're in need. Don't harvest to the edge of your field. We can learn what it means through the command Love your neighbor as yourself. Kind of the opposite problem is, uh, is when there's commands in the Bible that are very tuned to the ancient world, and we can have, struggle, we can have a struggle making them fit. For example, uh, the Bible contains several passages about uh, how slaves should be treated. So in the Old Testament, there's Exodus 21. Uh, in the New Testament, there's Ephesians 6. Both of them lay down instructions on how masters are to treat their slaves. So is the Bible okay with slavery? It's easy to skip over 
passages like that or dismiss the Bible as you know, not mattering today or even being evil because it, it's okay with slavery. It's not. God, God's law, the heart of it, is to love God with everything and love our neighbors as ourselves. And those commands aren't for a perfect world. We're not supposed to love our neighbors once everything's good. Slavery, horribly enough, was normal in the ancient world. Was normal in Moses' time, was normal in Jesus' time, and horrifyingly still happens in places today. The commands to treat your slaves well as though they're human beings that matter to God, are very different from anything else in the ancient world. And they don't mean, oh, it's okay for us to have slaves. That was a horrible mistake made by Christians to justify the institution of slavery because of the rules and how to make it not as awful. Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself is going to, is supposed to change the way our, our whole system and society works. And there's going to be commands that are about problems that hopefully we don't have as much anymore. Very few people uh, would actually justify slavery now, and that's a good thing. Let's not turn away from the Bible. Let's use that. And, and look around the world and say, who's still uh, being used and abused? Who still needs extra protection from God's people? Love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself can help us to obey even those hardest parts of Scripture. And after this conversation about the law, uh, where Jesus lays out these, these two things that summarize, that, that let you understand the whole rest of the law, um, this young scholar says, you know, you're right. Loving God and taking care of your neighbor are more important than all the religious rules, more important than all the sacrifices. That's what helps us understand. And Jesus looks at him and says, you are not far from the kingdom. You're not far from the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is the thing that Jesus talks about most. What is the world like when we actually let God rule in our own hearts and in the world around us? What is it like when God's in charge? And he tells this religious expert, you're not far. Interestingly, he doesn't say you're in. He doesn't say you get it, and so you belong to the kingdom. Because that's not how entry into the kingdom of God works. So often we read about the rules trying to be good enough good enough to get into heaven, good enough to count as a good person, whatever that means. And like with speeding, you know, everyone who's worse than us is terrible, and everyone who's, you know, looks better than us must be hiding something, must be faking something, or must be, you know, a saint that's really different from me. But Jesus isn't calling us to be good enough. He uses a pretty terrifying word, quoting Deuteronomy, and that's all. You will love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. I don't know how many tests you ever got 100% on in school. I'm guessing not many. 
How often do we actually give our whole heart to something instead of just enough to get by? This young ruler, who, young, uh, young scholar who understands Jesus so well is close to the kingdom. But to actually get in, we need grace. Loving God with everything we have and everything we are and loving the people around us like we love ourselves won't get us into heaven. It won't get us to be citizens of the kingdom of God. Only Jesus does that. Only trusting him does that. We are saved by God's gift. And that is not something that makes us sit back and do nothing or do less. We're not called to love God with everything so that we can be good enough. We're called to love God as a thank you. And that's actually kind of scary. In his book, uh, The Prodigal God, Timothy Keller, a pastor from uh, New York, uh, puts it so beautifully well. He describes uh, a conversation with a woman uh, who came into his office about grace and being saved entirely by God's gift. And she said, uh, that's really frightening. And, and here's what he says in the introduction to that book. I asked her what was so scary about unmerited free grace. And she replied something like this. If I was saved by my good works, then there would be a limit to what God could ask of me or put me through. I'd be like a taxpayer with rights. I would have done my duty, and now I would deserve a certain quality of life. But if it is really true that I'm a sinner saved by sheer grace, at God's initiative, at God's ultimate cost, then there's nothing he cannot ask of me. God has already given you the gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. God has already called us uh, not just to follow a whole bunch of rules, but to give our lives over to Jesus. Now, if you're watching this on Sunday, uh, today is, uh, is Halloween. It's uh, a day when kids go out and, you know, run around in costumes and tons of people's lawns are super gross and scary looking. Uh, but Halloween used to not be as big a day deal as the day that came after it. November 1st is All Hallows Day, All Saints Day. Sometimes we, uh, we think of saints as people that are somehow magically better than us. These men and women who followed God so faithfully that they get churches named after them, that they get remembered for centuries. We think of them as different from us. You know, I'm not a saint, but I'm good enough. The truth is that a saint is someone that God has made holy. Not because they were amazing at following the rules, but because he chose to give the life of his son. We are all, when we follow Jesus, saints. And that means that by God's grace, we can love God with everything that's in our heart, every emotion and impulse. As a saint, you can love God with all of your understanding, with every one of your thoughts, with the way you think about the world. You can love God with all of your strength, every bit of energy that God has given you. As a saint of God, you can love God with your whole being. And in that love, 
that you can take care of your neighbor. You can love them too. We've already received this as a gift. So let's live it out with thanks. Amen. we have everything to thank you for. We have been saved by your infinitely costly gift of Jesus Christ. We belong to you and your kingdom. And so, Lord, you've given us yourself and along with yourself, everything else. Thank you, Lord, for this gift. And may our whole lives be a thank you. We pray uh, for our own relationship with you, that it can grow and deepen, that we can trust you more. And we pray that you will help us to love the people you've given us in our lives. Help us to uh, take care of our families and closest friends, the people who uh, trust us and look to us. And Lord, uh, different people we care about are struggling with many different things. We ask for your healing and guidance. We ask for your wisdom and strength. We thank you, Lord, for the neighbors we have uh, whose names we don't know. The people around us that we 
overlook the, the stranger uh, who's different from ourselves. Help us to love our neighbor in who we are together, in the rules we set up um, as a church together, as workplaces, as schools, as governments. May we love the neighbors that we don't know but that you have given. And may we love our neighbors um, throughout the world. May we take care of uh, the environment that we all share. May we work to end uh, war and famine. May we find homes for people. May we live together as citizens of your kingdom. God, give us strength for this task. By your Holy Spirit, and by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. You are sold for the earth, O oh people, sold for the kingdom of God. Share the flavor of life, O oh people, life in the kingdom of God. Bring forth the kingdom of mercy, bring forth the kingdom of peace, bring forth the kingdom of justice, bring forth the city of God. You are a light on the hill, O oh people, light for the city of God, shine so holy and bright, O oh people, shine for the kingdom of serve the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen.